political uh, trends of the region. And also uh, because of this, uh, we also needed to, uh, I would say, to contribute to analyzing the recent situation there, what is changing perceptions or misperceptions from each uh, uh, in original country. So uh, our attempt uh, was somehow to bring uh, also to young researchers from three uh, South Caucasian country and to reflect on these changes. And of course, uh, ch challenges are numerous there and we cannot uh, think that we will cope with all of them or we will analyze all of them, but at least this was the attempt uh, from our side. And I know that we had a uh, quite good team and we worked uh, during a uh, few months uh, with uh, this young team. And one of the ideas of also, also of this uh, sort of workshops and seminars and conferences is also to, uh, to create some sort of networks of uh, young researchers along the South Caucasus, because sometimes I have a feeling that this is not only my observation also that we sometimes, at least in Georgia, we may know a little bit more about what's going on, I don't know, in Germany or some other countries. And sometimes we don't care or we don't have so much information about our immediate neighborhood, uh, neighbors and uh, in what's going on in, uh, in, in the, our region. So I think this definitely needs to be changed, uh, especially in terms of research. We really need to uh, work on this. and. Uh, I'm really glad that uh, together with the uh, we managed to um, to uh, set up this program. And uh, of course, as I said, this will not solve all the problems uh, with this. And we need, of, of course, more um, involvement from researchers and from acad academia and some other uh, think tanks as well. But at least this is uh, what we aimed. And I'm really glad to uh, see uh, today our participants. Um, and uh, the, I will be. Um, it, it will be very interesting to hear their input. And I again uh, would like to thank Hande Will Stiftung and uh, uh, I hope that we will have a very interesting uh, discussion today. Thank you. And I would like now to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Sonia Schiffers, who, who will be also uh, representing Hande Will Stiftung. Uh, Sonia, floor is yours. Um, thank you, Corneli. Um, hello, everyone. A warm welcome also from me and from the Heinrich Böll Foundation South Caucasus office. Um, before we begin, I would like to express my gratitude to the Jordan Institute of Politics for our excellent cooperation within the framework of this project and also beyond it. Um, I think that once all of the articles um, to be produced within this project are finalized, um, this year's collaboration will have yielded five very interesting papers uh, on various crucial questions the region is facing with many valuable policy recommendations. But as Corneli has already said, um, the project will also have expanded our network, contributed to the skill of evidence-based policy analysis and trained us all in giving and receiving feedback. Um, thanks to our authors for their openness and patience in this regard. Um, a question that I have asked several of the authors to approach critically is how much have the geopolitical realities in the Caucasus really changed after the Second Karab Karabakh War? Um, personally, I am not convinced that we are seeing an epochal shift, um, but I think we rather see a confirmation and expansion of previous realities, with Russia being the main actor in terms of military security or insecurity, um, and conflict management around Karabakh and the other conflicts in the region, and Turkey becoming more and more economically and militarily active in the region. Um, the EU, if we are honest, has never been a security actor in the tra tra traditional sense of the term. Um, one of the major issues that me and many others are thinking about is um, what role for the EU and Germany in this regional power constellation in the future? Is a strong conflict management role for the EU conceivable? Would it benefit from more value-based or from more pragmatic engagement in the region? Is there a chance for the resurrection of liberal peace building and democratic conditionality that despite all its limitations, in my view, still promises a better and more stable future for the residents of the South Caucasus than the law of the strongest? I'm glad that we will have several interesting inputs on these questions today and look forward to our discussions. The first round will be moderated by my colleague Lilia Cichlatze, and Lilia, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Sonia, um, and um, thank you, Dr. Gonelli, also uh, for your opening remarks. Um, so our first panel will be focused on the uh, role of the EU in the South Caucasus, um, as it is uh, one of the most important issues, um, yes, that we are discussing uh, within the framework of this project and beyond. Um, 
the uh, and also one of the reason, of course, is that uh, the reality that we live uh, now uh, after the second uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh war. And um, yes, um, as um, Sonia already mentioned, uh, there is, of course, um, um, certain discussion among foreign policy um, circles, among um, civil society, and uh, many others on how can we, um, uh, how to discuss, and also how um, how to ensure um, use uh, uh, increased engagement. If, um, of course, there is. Um, uh, such willingness from the side of the EU and um, also um, because we, we have had many uh, discussions about, uh, the, uh, about, about the weekend role and our authors also emphasize this very much uh, in the papers that the, um, uh, after uh, the second the Nagorno-Karabakh war during this process and, and of course the role of the EU has weakened uh, and uh, um, uh, which uh, of course, made it easier for other actors like Russia and Turkey to uh, be more present um, in the region. And of course, uh, um, this also changes um, in a way um, certain um, uh, situations. Um, so uh, first of all, um, uh, one of our fellow, Hasmi Khachatrian, who is a former research fellow at the Institute of European Democrats, will focus on the geopolitical reshuffling in the South Caucasus and will um, talk about some of the uh, policy options that um, you might consider consider. Uh, then uh, we will have uh, Dr. Michael Sarjualadze's um, presentation. Um, uh, Michael is a visiting scholar at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Um, and um, uh, both of the uh, presentations uh, and um, uh, recommendations that will be um, uh, assessed and discussed by uh, Ms. Shorena Lotkipanze, who is co-founder and board member um, of the Civil Council of Defense and Security. Um, thank you, Shorena, for joining us. Uh, it's very nice. Um, so I would now give floor to Hasmik. Um, and um, yes, let's um, um, hear her um, main arguments, main findings, and policy recommendations that she has developed in the paper. Um, I think, yes, Hasmik, could you please um, start? Yep, so uh, hello everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. And I was much glad to be part of this project. It was a remarkable um, event in order to have a major reflection on the current development in this part of the world. So thanks for the Georgian Institute of Politics and also Heinle for Stiftu. So I'll focus on geopolitical reshuffling in the South Caucasus in the aftermath of the 2020 in the Bonn and the uh, I cannot. I don't know how about the others. No, it's really bad quality for interpretation. It's almost impossible. It, like it is possible to hear, but to interpret. No, yes, but continue. But if you have headset or headphone, it would be really great because your voice gets a bit echo and. I think Hasmik is, has language interpretation is not activated in her case because she cannot hear me. So tell her. Please yeah, she cannot her hear. Like I cannot hear her talk at all. Oh, that's also. Hasmik, did you activate the interpretation? Did you choose English uh, on the globe icon? Like you, you cannot hear me. Uh, so did you choose English channel on the globe icon? Okay, English. Yeah. Yes. Is it okay no. now? No, I can hear it. Yes. Okay. So is, is it okay now? It's okay, but um, yes. If you have headset somewhere near, that would be great because the quality of the audio is not that good. But if not, I will try my best as interpreter speaking. Okay, let, let's see. Not not working again. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. Let's continue, let's not lose time. Sorry, let's continue, <laughs> thank you. Okay, it's fine. So uh, I'll speak about geopolitical reshuffling in the South Caucasus in the aftermath of the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war and the EU's policy options. So next slide, please. First and foremost, it is significant to, to reflect on the EU's power position prior to the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war 
And uh, to this end, it is important to mention that the collapse of the Soviet Union back in the 1990s changed the geopolitical atmosphere uh, in the South Caucasus and uh, broadly speaking. And to this end, uh, it opened a space for the involvement of factors such as the European Union in the region. So back in the 1990s, the European Union and the South Caucasus countries signed partnership and cooperation agreements which uh, paved the way for a development of relations. Later on, in 2004, European Union launched the European Neighborhood Policy. 2009 is a partnership policy, um, which were aimed uh, for further development and investment of ties between the EU and the South Caucasus states, which will be Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. And uh, there, are association, there is association agreement, DCFTA signed between EU and uh, Georgia, and the uh, comprehensive enhanced partnership agreement signed between Armenia and the European Union. But when it comes to the security aspect, provided that the South Caucasus has been affected by a frozen or armed conflict. So, and precisely if we are talking about the Bona Karaba conflict resolution, European Union kept low profile as the resolution talks were held in the framework of the OSCE Minsk group, co-chaired by the EU member France, United States and, uh, United States and Russia. And the European Union's heavy emphasis has been on track to diplomacy, which means civil society is building and confidence building measures. But of course, um, like uh, prior to the war, European Union strive to, to promote peace, stability, and to strengthen sovereignty and independence of the South Caucasus states. However, unfortunately, the, the 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war, which was launched by Turkey, about by Azerbaijan, heavily militarily and uh, politically backed by Turkey, has uh, provoked major geopolitical shifts in the South Caucasus, has certainly undermined uh, European Union long effort to promote peace and, and also has, has uh, really deteriorated regional security environment vehemently. Uh, so we can uh, have the uh, next slide, please. And if we are talking about geopolitical reshuffling in the South Caucasus, first and foremost, when it comes to Armenia and Azerbaijan, Armenia certainly finds itself in a weak, vulnerable position when it comes to national security. It has become strategically dependent on Russia for security guarantees for itself. And Nagorno-Karabakh, as for Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan uses coercive tactics and tries to extort maximum concessions from Armenia. As for the external actors, Russia, Turkey certainly has emerged as dominant powers in the South Caucasus, and Russia's policy towards the South Caucasus is uh, determined by broader geopolitical strategic considerations, security concerns pertaining to the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea regions, and uh, Russia certainly tries to work closely with um, Azerbaijan, keeping it away from Turkey, and also keeping Turkey um, trying trying to. Um, uh, work uh, with Turkey in order, uh, let's say, provided the security concerns pertaining to the Black Sea region. As for Turkey, Turkey certainly strives to maximize its power in the South Caucasus, and um, and uh, if, even if there are some calculations that Turkey may uh, choose U-turn and move away from from NATO, let's say, quit NATO formally, to me that that, that is um, uh, that is not particularly realistic because Turkey immensely benefits from its NATO membership. As for the European Union, again, as I mentioned, the European Union strives for promoting peace stability, but these efforts have been nullified uh, against the backdrop of the war and European Union power in this part of the world has been downgraded in strategic terms. And the European Union strives to refine, to rediscover its power, and we are trying to assess, I'm trying to assess to what extent, uh, what are the prospects of these engagements in the South Caucasus as a geopolitical actor. The next slide. Yes, if we are talking about the prospects, I would say uh, we can identify three main issues, three main uh, constraints. So first and foremost, the question is, is the European Union willing to get engaged in the South Caucasus as a geopolitical actor? And uh, that is quite a challenging issue because the European Union is a union of 27 different member states with um, divergent threat risk assessment, strategic priorities, foreign policy priorities, and European Union foreign policy decisions are taken by consensus, which certainly um, limits the EU's um, how uh, room for the European Union to maneuver, including in the South Caucasus. 
Second of all, second constraint is the South Caucasus a strategic priority for the European Union. And again, EU faces the quite challenging strategic environment, both externally and internally. Internally, it's got to deal with, uh, with the, uh, let's say, uh, Euroscepticism, rising Euroscepticism, or uh, Brexit. Uh, externally, there are so many threats and risks, which would be terrorism, conflicts, wars in the Middle East, North Africa, Ukraine uh, conflict, so uh, that's, 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 there are so many issues uh, to, to work on. And the third is going to deal with shifting power dynamics in uh, Turkey European Union relations. Because if we were to compare, like in 2000s, early 2000s, Turkey used to be more accommodating towards the European Union and uh, uh, so, for instance, back in 2009, there was an attempt uh, on the EU, US, uh, by uh, having the US and the European Union also playing active roles, the member states playing active roles, and to trying to promote Armenia Turkey normalization, which culminated back in 2009 with the signage of the Zurich Protocol, which were never implemented, by the way. But then nowadays we see that um, at the time of the nagorno karabakh war, EU, NATO, US diplomatic efforts uh, uh, were not uh, seem, were, were to fail, and uh, Turkey, they couldn't like go by diplomacy stop Turkey. As for policy recommendations, next slide, please. So. Uh, Provided this, uh, there are a series of poli policy recommendations offered to certain actors, be it European Parliament, European External Action Service, France, and the United States. Uh, provided the fact that the European Union tries to, to activate its efforts in this part of the world and uh, tries to revive its policies, uh, sorry, revive its role. So, to the European Parliament, uh, a recommendation would be to all sessions, to all discussions on the EU's foreign policy decision making, and uh, uh, so hold discussion for a, for resorting to the option of simple majority voting or or proceeding to multi-speed Europe. Uh, there, uh, so that could be useful also to hold the discussion on strategic geopolitical currents in the South Caucasus, and also an option could be for the MEPs who are working on. Uh, Turkey, EU Turkey relations uh, to, to design some sort of a containment policy towards Turkey. To the European External Action Service, it is recommended to review uh, EU's policy towards the South Caucasus and uh, to adapt, uh, generally speaking, when it comes to the EU's uh, foreign policy conduct, to adapt more of a flexible approach. And uh, when it comes to the Nagorno Karabakh conflict the resolution, I would say for France and the United States, an option could be to devise a comprehensive conflict resolution plan. And for this, uh, there could be working groups established in the premises of the United States uh, Department and the French Ministry of Foreign European Affairs. And uh, of course, uh, a conflict resolution plan could later be addressed in the format of the OSC Minsk group. So this is basically it. Uh, so I'll be much glad to, to engage in discussion and uh, to respond to your questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, thank you, Hasmik, for presenting main arguments um, of your um, policy paper, as well as uh, um, uh, policy recommendations, um, and um, especially because you um, addressed the um, European Parliament, um, um, and um, yes, so they have certain recommendations, yes, to, uh, towards um, changing um, um, foreign policy. Um, uh, maybe it's also uh, good now to move to the second question and um, uh, second question of our um, discussion today which is about uh, how can the passivity of Berlin and Brussels during the Nagorno-Karabakh war be explained and what are the interests and corresponding policy options now. Um, our next um, speaker, Dr. Mikhail um, Sarjola, they will um, uh, mostly focus on the German perspective and I will uh, give floor now to him, but also I would like to uh, remind our audience that uh, they can already send their questions in uh, question and answer box and we will have in the end uh, time for um, um, discussion. So, uh, yes, Michael, please. Hello, Lilia. Can you hear me? That's great. That's great. <laughs> and can you see my presentation also? Yes, we can see that. Nice. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction. And I want to thank you also to Heinrich Bill Foundation and Georgian Institute for Politics for this great uh, chance uh, um, to join this project um, about geopolitical shifts. Um, and uh, I will 
I will, I will start with my presentation, uh, which is um, the title is More Responsibility or Lack of Interest, German Perspective on the South Caucasus after the Second um, Second Karabakh War. Um, so um, um, I have chosen the German Perspective on the South Caucasus for two reasons. Uh, first, um, the EU was sharply uh, criticized during the Karabakh War um, for not acting as a geopolitical actor and for leaving the room for maneuver to other actors. For me, the question was: Is um, if the use restraint depended um, uh, depended uh, um, on the fact that uh, there has there has been no driving force within the European Union to advance an active EU foreign policy towards South Caucasus? And secondly, um, um, and secondly, I decided to look at German perspective uh, because Germany is one of the influential EU countries. Um, and uh, Germany has close ties to South Caucasian countries. Um, first more, uh, Germany's new federal government will not only decide um, on the direction of German foreign policy, uh, but will also influence the EU foreign policy in the future. And I, I think it's very important to look at the German perspective. Um, the new government uh, is now directly confronted uh, with the geopolitical shifts and changes in the use uh, Eastern neighborhood. Um, and this applies not only to Ukraine, but also to the South Caucasus, South Caucasus uh, in the post-war uh, phase. So I divided this point into two levels, which you um, which you can see um, on the um, uh, you know, on our uh, display. Um, so the next point is um, uh, the question why the German perspective is important uh, for South Caucasus. Um, the evaluation of German perspective is important because Germany is one of the important partners of the uh, South Caucasian states, not only in Europe, but also worldwide. And Germany's interests are mainly um, in the security policy field, but, but Berlin is also interested in stabilization, democratization, and uh, as the importance of South Caucasus as a transport corridor. Um, uh, Germany is the second largest donor after the US um, uh, in the region uh, regarding the development cooperation. Um, and. Um, at the same time, uh, um, this is, is, is importance is, uh, um, of course, uh, part of German uh, policy or German view on South Caucasus, but we have to take a look uh, on German policy in last years. Uh, in last years. Um, so I, I want to come to the next slide, um, um, which uh, there are a lot of changes and contra contradictions in German foreign policy which are important from the perspective of Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. Um, the extent uh, to which German foreign policy has been affected by changes and contradiction, contrasts is most striking um, in the case of Eastern neighbors of European Union. Since Germany has avoided um, an additional conflict potential with Russia since the last war in Ukraine as the latest, we should assume that the uh, Russian factor will continue to uh, be relevant in shaping, shaping German foreign policy towards the South Caucasus as well. Um, on the one hand, uh, we have to consider the downgrading of Russia as a strategic partner um, that now poses a threat, threat uh, to the European security order. Um, but um, regarding German foreign policy, at the same time, the interests of Eastern partnership countries are more strongly perceived in Berlin. Now, on the other hand, um, uh, Nord Stream was announced uh, for a long time as an economic project uh, um, by German politicians. Um, and this selfish bypassing its uh, European neighbors, uh, the German government thereby gave Russia the opportunity to exert influence on the EU. Um, in this context, um, we see a kind of co a continuity of German foreign policy, which hopes um, a positive influence on Russia uh, through economic uh, ties and contacts. Uh, um, um, there, uh, the question is uh, if there is a need for reorientation or new orientation of German foreign policy. Um, and uh, uh, in that case, um, uh, this question arises in post Merkel era. Um, and um, uh, the answer is uh, that there is a need uh, for to change uh, German foreign policy. And there are several arguments. Uh, um, when we think about the Nagorno Karabakh war, it, about the recent second Nagorno-Karabakh war, uh, we saw that um, Germany's, uh, uh, Germany's reaction was uh, very weak and Germany held back. But at the same time, um, 
uh, a lot of German politicians uh, emphasized uh, uh, that uh, Germany has to take more international responsibility in last years. Uh, um, um, but uh, when we are considering Germany's reaction to the Nagorno-Karabakh war, we saw that um, German foreign policy lacked not only the will, but also the instrument to intervene. Um, and uh, if you see German foreign policy in bigger perspective, um, we have to assume that um, German, German foreign policy must be adapted to the change in international order. South Caucasian states could benefit from a German policy, for, foreign policy that seeks to secure the EU's strategic interests in its neighborhood, um, maybe as a driving force. Uh, um, so I want to come to the next point, um, uh, to the relations between South Caucasian states and Germany. Um, uh, the um, example of Germany's weak reaction to the Nagorno-Karabakh war and during the war shows that South Caucasus is recently far down in the list of priorities uh, from German perspective. Germany has not uh, proactively called for intensive engagement um, on the part of the EU at the EU level um, and as a simple member of uh, OSCE means group Germany cannot achieve anything at this level. Um, at the same time, Berlin has no ambition to influence the functionality of Minsk group more strongly. Um, and the lack of uh, interest in the South Caucasus was demonstrated um, by the example of the German EU presidency, whose priority was not even um, the Eastern partnership, as well as the election programs of political parties before the Bundestag uh, elections in Germany uh, two months ago. Um, we saw that uh, South Caucasus was um, only mentioned in passing. Um, we can, uh, at, the at the same time, we can um, observe that the expectations of Germany and uh, um, the South Caucasian countries um, uh, do not uh, coincide. Uh, um, so um, uh, I want to come to the conclusions. Um, there are some points uh, which you can see on display. Um, Germany. Germany have to, re but, but we have to assume that the new government government will have to react to the fact uh, that the geopolitical shifts in the South Caucasus, um, uh, uh, yeah, and um, because of as regarding the as to the importance of the region uh, for the EU, also they will um, to be a driving force. Uh, nor high interests are present uh, uh, in German foreign policy. And in contrast to Ukraine, as I, I mean, towards the South Caucasus. Um, and in contrast to Ukraine, the conflicts in the South Caucasus do not have a priority position uh, from the German perspective. And fundamentally, German foreign policy lacks a strategy on, uh, on how Germany should position um, itself according to its power at the European level. Um, and uh, it lacks also a vision how the EU can pursue its strategic goal, goals in the European neighborhood. neighborhood. We should assume that uh, the new German government uh, with a new constellation of political parties um, will put uh, a stronger focus on the South Caucasus, for example, regarding conflicts, reforms, or human rights. Uh, but we should not, not expect um, drastic, drastic changes. Uh, so I, I have uh, picked up some recommendations from my recommendation list. Uh, um, and I think that, um, that the European Union um, uh, has to act uh, regarding unresolved conflicts uh, if the European Union doesn't want to remain in the role of a cash cow. And uh, um, I had some ideas regarding organizing a South Caucasus conference, maybe in Georgia, um, but also the ex to extend the mandate of the EU special representative in the region uh, for more involving in OSC Minsk group, um, but also to review the possibility uh, of active participation uh, for peace monitoring after 2025. Um, regarding Georgia, um, I recommended that uh, co consistent use of conditionality towards the Georgian government beyond financial means to prevent uh, the erosion of democratic developments, uh, uh, which we saw actually um, in the case of Georgia. And uh, final point, uh, I recommend, I have also some recommendations for Germany. Um, and uh, one of them is a rec reconsideration of negative attitudes towards uh, associated countries. Um, in the case of South Caucasus, this country is Georgia, uh, but also to revitalization of the idea to establish a new South Caucasus strategy. And maybe Germany could play a, drive, a role of driving force in that case. Um, um, I also recommended um, active, enga active engagement in demining border definition and demarcation process in case of Armenia and Azerbaijan. 
Um, and the final point is um, today is a role of driving force to complement the Eastern partnership with security components in relation to the um, unresolved conflict. So, um, so I finished my presentation and I would be happy to get some questions by participants. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michael, for this very interesting um, review of um, uh, Germany's foreign policy and also emphasizing some of the contradictions. I would now like to hand over to um, Sharina Lotkipende, who will um, comment and give feedback on uh, the papers. Um, Sharina, please. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, event today. It's a great honor for me. Um, I have read papers, and um, I've listened to participants, and, this, uh, and I was part of this process in uh, July as well. And actually, uh, itself, the initiative to involve um, young researchers, uh, professionals in uh, reflecting on, on, the, on the current affairs, uh, um, uh, geopolitical, political, all kind of developments in, in South in the South Caucasus is very important, especially after last year, after Karabakh War and um, um, the developments we face. The main question, actually, in both um, uh, um, uh, policy papers, is. Uh, whether this reshuffling happened or whether if um, or what kind of reshuffling happened can we call it geopolitical can we say that um, before uh, the conflict was frozen in a certain way or was um, warming up uh, time to time uh, or what was the actually um, of course uh, turkey was not uh, part of that process before this war and um, uh, with turkey's uh, appearance on the geopolitical um, agenda let's say of the south caucasus we can speak about one major change which uh, happened with uh, activating um, regional power turkey in south caucasus affairs and actually this is um, uh, what is discussed um, quite well um, in Hasmik's paper and actually this is uh, her recommendations towards uh, parties and I, I liked most of all how she has uh, regrouped uh, grouped um, these uh, parties yeah so we see European Parliament but and it's so interesting because um, I think the problem she uh, posed uh, let's say in her um, paper is uh, uh, that of course 27 countries have different attitudes toward different things but on the other hand we expect from European Union one position, solid position, and being part of these uh, processes, and how important is this decision-making mechanism in the European Parliament? And maybe we can reflect on that and just give some impulses to European Parliament on that regard. So decision-making is very important. Uh, another thing I, I, I'm, uh, she is proposing and addressing America and France together, not separately. And I, I think that that's also quite interesting and understandable because more or less we see from America, uh, United States and France, the very similar attitude of the resolutions their legislative bodies are with drafting and approving and um, uh, so that, that's that's very interesting uh, kind of uh, finding for me. Uh, what's important also um, uh, in this, and especially when we speak about Michael's paper, and uh, uh, very interesting that this Germans uh, Germany's role is under under um, kind of um, uh, lined, and um, the center of this paper is Germany. And uh, once again, there are a lot of discussions about Germany's role, but that insight you are bringing is very peculiar. Uh, first of all, um, um, very interesting from the perspective that uh, we want to understand what Germany wants. What is the stance of Germany? Is Germany going to interfere as geopolitical actor? Uh, not uh, yeah, Germany as Germany and as G Germany as part of European Union. But I think these are the two identities. Germany is somehow struggling uh, uh, in, in ter itself, let's say. Yeah, and especially now when Germany has a new government with new coalition with different political parties, which were not so actively in the previous government. Yeah, I think that that um, I think these recommendations could be very very useful for them, uh, at least to 
to read uh, what people, experts in the South Caucasus are thinking about Germany. I think that could help maybe them somehow to reflect on their identity from South Caucasian perspective. Um, uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, uh, what is going on um, in this, I, I think these discussions should continue. I mean, uh, of course, we have no answers to lots of questions, and uh, we have no answers what is good for South Caucasus, what we think is good, what we are going as uh, members of this, uh, uh, I don't know, territorial, political uh, space here, what we are thinking about uh, ourselves and how we are going to, to handle all those issues. Uh, so the, those questions are not answered, and I don't think that there, there was, uh, um, it's, um, there is need to answer those questions because this is the process and uh, uh, it's very well observed in your papers that you have very good understanding on the process itself uh, and um, that, that that's absolutely true that change itself is uh, somehow uh, some kind of decision of the existing conflict but of course conflict is not uh, uh, finished, it's there, and of course it, it needs uh, some recovery, treatment, healing, and many other things, and the role of partners is absolutely essential in that, And but how we are engaged them, it's geopolitical engagement, it's uh, social, political, cultural, I don't know, other engagements, of course it also depends on ourselves and our own identity and positioning uh, in front of European Union and our Western partners. So thank you very much for this uh, intellectual pleasure um, I received from reading your papers and listening to you. And um, yeah, that, that's um, in very shortly, I wanted to share with you about my um, reflections um, uh, and uh, about my uh, perspectives maybe, how to continue these discussions. Uh, and um, also, I think that you have to think a bit more about advocacy because these recommendations and your thoughts should be somehow um, uh, addressed to those who are making decision in the in our region and of course in Europe, European Union and in the West. Thank you very much once again. Pleasure. Um, thank you, Sharina, for your um, feedback. Um, I would now give uh, floor to Michael and Hasmik in case they want to um, uh, react or uh, maybe comment and answer some of the questions or issues uh, raised by Sharina. And I also would like just to say that what you mentioned, Sharina, regarding that WOCAS is definitely very crucial. Um, and I think um, yeah, Georgian Institute of Politics in this regard uh, always makes an um, effort um, to ensure that these recommendations are not just uh, uh, in the small circle, uh, but uh, are really advocated uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, with the policymakers, and uh, there are some uh, activities planned in this regard. So, yeah, just to also respond to you on this. Um, so, I don't know, maybe Mikhail and Hasmik, in case you don't um, have um, comments or questions, that's uh, also uh, fine. We could move then to the second panel. So, maybe very briefly. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your uh, feedback. Thanks for your thoughts. It's, it's quite interesting to hear too. And uh, just like briefly to mention, for me, while writing this policy brief, so first and foremost, of course, I mean, I couldn't really accommodate too much because of the like limits of the, the space. But um, so the bottom line for me is this, to what extent the European Union is willing to engage in the South Caucasus as a geopolitical actor because much depends certainly on the position of the Caucasus state. And uh, there could be huge discussion about this, that there are so many problematic aspects. Uh, yes, certainly. But also if the European Union uh, wishes to engage in the Caucasus, so there are so many aspects, so many policy tools that the European can use. It's not about the lack of the European Union's power, it's about to what extent European Union wishes to engage. Because like here, I talk about European Union policy options, not the European Union strategic options. Because I mean, I covered the strategic options back in November, uh, sorry, back in um, 2020. So there are a lot of strategic options for the EU in case European Union wishes to be a geopolitical actor. And also, uh, like, um, again, I mean, I, I couldn't do a comparative analysis, but if we were to go deep and look, let's say, at the 1990s when the Soviet Union collapsed, certainly uh, back then there was a big United States strategy, European Union also being like uh, playing a complementary role in, in parts of this 
strategy. So the US, EU used to be strategic actors in this part of the world. We can see during the nagorno karabakh conflict event process, we can go back 2001, Key West attempt to solve nagorno karabakh conflict, and there was like a very good uh, chance to solve the conflict. But then again, like Armenia, Turkey, they were certainly strategic. So the bottom line was to change the whole strategic picture in this part of the world. So then there is this another aspect, what extends local actors just to make use of those opportunities. But then we can have huge like hours of discussion about all this. So thank you so much for your thoughts. And uh, uh, really, uh, I was glad to be part of this project. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, Mosul, to you. Um, Hasmik Mikhail, yes, please respond. Um, yeah, very short. Uh, I want to I want to thank uh, Shorana for, for 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 commenting our text. Um, it was very interesting overview, and uh, maybe for the discussion, um, I will I will uh, leave a question: um, Why should we consider European Union as a geopolitical actor when we see that uh, most influential actors like like France or Germany uh, are acting uh, in partisan way or have no interest and desire um, uh, to make to make uh, European Union to a geopolitical actor. Thank you. Um, thank you also for this uh, question. Maybe we can also address it uh, later when we um, uh, yeah, finish um, all the presentations. I will not take uh, uh, more of your time. Uh, so I would now hand over to Dr. Shotaka Kapadze um, who will moderate the second panel. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Lily, and thank you, all the presenters. And I hope the second panel is going to be also quite interesting. I'll be very brief since we're already 15 minutes behind uh, our agenda. So uh, there are going to be three papers in this panel, which address also internal discourses, especially after the Karbakh War. And uh, Mariam Gamplishvili, uh, who will have a first uh, presentation, is going also to introduce a little bit of China and Chinese influence in the South Caucasus, which I think is also an interesting aspect uh, which needs to be taken into consideration when we talk about uh, geopolitics. And then in the end, uh, Dr. Eka Kobia from the Cox School of Governance at the Cox University, the Dean actually of the school is going to briefly summarize and provide her comments and feedback to the presentations. A person I know her, she was my lecturer of international relation theory. So thank you Dr. Eka for agreeing, uh, taking part in this uh, wonderful panel. And also I remind all the attendees that there's an option of Q&A. So in the first round, after the end of this panel, we will uh, read out those Q&A questions and participants will have an opportunity to answer to those. And then there'll be a second round where you will have an opportunity to also ask a question personally without the Q&A option. And also if you have questions already to the previous speakers, do write them in Q&A or keep them for the second round when you will have an option to Ask them personally. So first I give a floor to Mariam Gamtelishvili now, who is an affili affiliate fellow at the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication at the George Washington University. And then I'll introduce the rest as we proceed with other speakers as well. Mariam, floor is yours and you have about eight minutes. Thanks. Thank you so much, Shara, for the introduction. And thank you, many thanks to Georgia Institute of Politics and Heinrich Bill Foundation for the opportunity that they've given us uh, because this was very great opportunity to develop our capacities as young researchers. Uh, I'll share my screen. Um, just give me a second for that. Uh, and um, yes, here we go. Uh, you can hear me and you can see the slides. Thank you. Well, uh, so the topic of my uh, research paper, my policy paper was Russian Chinese vaccine diplomacy in the South Caucasus against young South power, uh, where I tried to examine and look at the Russian and Chinese vaccine diplomacies in South Caucasus through the prism of soft power and as well as sharp power. Uh, and before diving into the uh, findings and recommendations, I just wanted to ask myself and as well as the audience why to talk about vaccine diplomacy now. Uh, it seems that uh, it has been, uh, it should be considered and it has been solely sort of the public good that has been offered to us during the COVID-19 uh, pandemics. But at the same time, the recent developments and uh, geopolitical shifts that we've been talking about today, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh war, uh, the discussions over the Black Sea security, the economic implications of the pandemics, and generally the uh, interrelations between uh, all three uh, South Caucasus countries, 
brought us back to the discussion of the great power competition. And I guess that was the sort of my initial aim and goal to see if there is such competition at all and how we can uh, see and pursue the, and look at the vaccine diplomacies in, South Cap in, in the South Caucasus. So, well, uh, generally all three um, countries, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan uh, have been in the spotlight of both uh, Russia and China, in China. Uh, from the very beginning of the global vaccine distribution. And the COVID pandemic established a sort of a new um, scientific and medical race among the countries uh, and uh, in their vaccine creation and spread. Uh, consequently, uh, we've seen that the vaccine diplomacy uh, has some sort, in some way, followed the uh, current geopolitical order where the Russia, China, United States, Germany, Great Britain, and European Union actually took the lead in, in that race. So uh, it was very interesting that when the medical institutions and companies in the West were heavily working on the vaccine trials, Russia already announced the appro approval of their Sputnik V vaccine back in August 2020 and offered their rollouts internally, both internally and globally uh, from fall 2020. Uh, China also uh, started to provide uh, back in February 2021 uh, their uh, vaccine rollout uh, and we're pledging very actively that this has been a global public good. Uh, the method that I've used uh, has been the uh, analysis of the secondary resources, uh, opinion poll data, news coverage, uh, the statements by the uh, politicians uh, in both in Russia and China. Uh, and uh, I, as I already mentioned, I tried to look at the vaccine diplomacies uh, through the analysis of soft and sharp power concepts. Uh, just give me a second. Okay, so just before I um, say a couple of words about what are soft and sharp power, I just want you to have a look at the uh, this map, uh, which very well shows that uh, China and Russia spread their vaccines globally. Uh, the gray spots of the United States and Western actors uh, could be the only ones who, uh, let's say, did not engage or did not receive their vaccines. But Russia and China um, obviously tried to, uh, you know, spread uh, the vaccines globally. Uh, and again, uh, through the examination of this soft and sharp power uh, concepts, I tried to see if they tried to influence any sort of the geopolitical order or, or anything in the South Caucasus. Uh, so, well, uh, when we talk about the uh, soft and sharp, sharp power concepts, uh, it's important to differentiate both of them. Uh, and in the sharp power, we must consider uh, the manipulative diplomatic policies uh, by one country to influence and undermine the political system of the uh, target country, while soft power aims at the attractiveness of the state, at their image, and at, at their nation branding as well. Uh, although both try to, in case of China, we've seen that they try to uh, create a sort of image repair uh, because of their spread of the uh, COVID and uh, the originations of the COVID and because of the uh, spread of the virus, uh, we've seen uh, and the general, uh, let's say, tendency has been uh, kind of um, the bundle of both soft and sharp power um, actions by both actors. So, I look uh, at the vaccination progress in both Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia uh, in my paper. Uh, I'm, I, I'm comparing uh, the um, number of the vaccines that were received uh, in countries by various actors. Uh, but one of the most important issues that have been uh, uh, raised uh, throughout the research was the uh, overall vaccine hesitancy that has been very much similar in all uh, three countries. Uh, and uh, you see the graph uh, where mostly half of the populations of all three countries have been hesitant to receiving the vaccines. Uh, at the same time, it was uh, because of the failure of the internal failures uh, in administering the vaccines uh, that were uh, caused by inability of decision makers and some of the responsible institutions to communicate efficiently with the public. Uh, the efforts uh, which are very largely linked to the sharp power by authoritarian, authoritarian actors such as Russia and China 
uh, and internal actors uh, who have been filled up as well uh, to oppose vaccination in general, uh, to they tried to undermine the West and not only uh, with their vaccine effectiveness and additionally created a sort of uh, obstacles for the public health matter uh, in all three countries. Um, so uh, the areas of Chinese and Russian soft power influence uh, in vaccine diplomacy and sort of uh, policy implications that I've observed uh, and were observed throughout the research uh, were uh, the expanding of the great power ambitions, especially by uh, China. Uh, and both actors very actively, Russia and China, were, let's say, blaming West on their uh, vaccine nationalism uh, while uh, pursuing uh, their narrative and their, um, let's say, uh, aims and goals uh, showing and showcasing that they are spreading the public good. Uh, also, uh, in case of China, for example, the um, vaccines were falling under the um, Belt and Road Belt and Road Initiative, as well as some cases of the uh, possible economic influence and leverage uh, over certain countries, developing countries, and especially our region, uh, were observed. Uh, both actors have been using hybrid tactics and information operations, especially uh, disinformation, which, about, which I'll be talking uh, a little bit later. Uh, also, both actors tried, actors tried to uh, pursue the long-term uh, leverage through the short-term uh, effects of the vaccine diplomacy, although we don't, we don't know yet uh, how long will be the uh, effect of the vaccine diplomacy. So they tried to uh, pursue the long-term leverage over the existence of power and the humanitarian efforts in general, again, as I already mentioned, because of their uh, pursuit uh, of spreading vaccines as a global public good. Disinformation and soft power. So uh, initially, uh, when we talk about the soft power, actually disinformation doesn't have uh, a place in it. Uh, and that's why uh, the manipulative actions uh, by both actors uh, fall under the sharp power concept. However, uh, the disinforma disinformation have been spread very actively uh, by the state media or online and traditional uh, media channels. And the similar tendency of uh, Armenian and Georgian uh, far-right groups and politicians who actually lobbied against the vaccination has been uh, observed, uh, which very much in, in line falls with the narratives that are spread by both Chinese and Russian uh, actors against the vaccination and that are diminishing the Western vaccine diplomacy. Uh, so the narrative that Russian vaccines are saving everyone uh, has been spread very extensively and China actually utilized and uh, adopted the Russian playbook uh, when it comes to the uh, spread of the disinformation and information operations. Uh, so uh, in the conclusion, I would just say, and I tried to answer uh, the question, so what was the aim of the Russian vaccine diplomacy? Uh, and in the future perspective, it can be observed that the uh, perspective aim actually lays in the possible increased leverage over the South Caucasus countries. Uh, it could be continuous effort to discredit and destabilize the trust in the vaccination, overall vaccination process and Western vaccine uh, in connection with its uh, leverage that already exists uh, through the soft power programs and soft power actions that they do in the South Caucasus region. region. And um, uh, for Russia in general, it would be the threat of force. And for China, it's, it's uh, economic dependency and economic leverage that it puts over the countries. Uh, I tried to give uh, several recommendations to the policymakers of Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Uh, and um, they are addressed to the decision makers. So I tried to imply uh, on fostering the dialogue to elaborate the certain strategies with the public health sector representatives, civil society organizations, and relevant line ministries. I tried to, um, let's say, advocate for the um, uh, more discussions and uh, the more research on soft power understanding of Russia and China, uh, which also includes the nation branding, the, their nation branding uh, abroad. Uh, and also uh, sort of assessments by the respective uh, policymakers and decision makers uh, on further policy planning and risk assessments. Uh, because the hesitancy remains very high in all three countries, uh, there is a kind of need to seek for the cooperation and share the experience on the bilateral levels through interagency maybe and working groups. And uh, the risk assessment uh, is uh, something that which, which is a key uh, here. And uh, maybe there is a need in that so that the analysis of influence of soft power activities of both Russia and China in respective countries could be conducted uh, internally. And uh, these can be done in cooperation with the civil society. Um, 
And I give a couple of recommendations to the EU, US international community, uh, where is the uh, Russia and China strategically expand their geopolitical influences uh, and their speculations over Western nationalism can be brought uh, and addressed by the EU and US. Uh, and maybe they even try to prioritize the countries, the developing countries in the process of vaccine diplomacy, uh, aiming at uh, all three uh, South Caucasus countries. Uh, and also, since the countries uh, seem to be highly vulnerable to the disinformation efforts and malign influence and sharp power itself, uh, the support should be continued and is needed. Uh, and again, our international community might try to address the issue of the vaccine diplomacy in the context of the geopolitical competition at the highest level. Um, I think that's all. I hope I'm not uh, over time. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I very much look forward for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. We went slightly over time, but again, I understand these topics are so interesting and, uh, you know, there's a lot to talk about and hopefully during the Q&A rounds we will touch some of the issues which Thank haven't you. been covered yet. I'm really looking forward to that one. Thanks again. Thank you. And now we move to the next presentation, which is by Bahrus Samadov, who is a PhD candidate uh, in political science at Charles University in Prague. So Bahrut, the uh, floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I, will, I would like to start uh, saying thank you to Heinrich Boll Stiftung and Georgian Institute of Politics for this opportunity for the Summer Academy and, of course, uh, for the opportunity to present our, uh, the outcomes of our uh, policy papers. And I would like to present my topic. It is about politics. Uh, it deals with the politics in Azerbaijan after the second Kar uh, Nagorno-Karabakh war and it shifts with actor behaviors. I mean, by actors, I mean political actors and discursive shifts uh, under uh, persistent authoritarian pressure in Azerbaijan and about <clears throat> generally about the situation uh, in Azerbaijan after the war. Uh, but first, I would like to mention a couple of points about the situation, uh, how it was within this so-called uh, 44 days war, because it's very important to understand the for uh, to understand the internal dynamics. You should go back to the war, how it was during during uh, the war. Uh, so first, the first point is uh, the fact that Azerbaijan witnessed the unprecedented unity of the nation in the name of uh, revenge, in the name of the uh, justice, how it was uh, understood, understood uh, in Azerbaijani society. And here, for example, parties, uh, uh, for example, 50 parties uh, signed joint statement uh, in the name of the support and uh, support to the army, to president, and so on. And second uh, important point is the fact that Aliyev popularity reached the peak. Of course, there is no data to prove it, but uh, if you look at some YouTube videos, if you look at uh, comment sections, you it's uh, it can be easily proven. And uh, this support, of course, is it's very important here because uh, before the war, um, uh, as in many authoritarian regimes, there was no. Uh, it, there is no aim at uh, mass support, uh, unlike totalitarian regimes. So it was mostly about passive acceptance of regime and uh, without any political antagonisms. So it was about massive depolitization. But during the war, uh, the situation had been changed and uh, the people supported their leader. And uh, of course, and after the war, it was it's clear that this popularity, even if not, it was not during the war, but still it was persistent you know, because of the victory. And the third point here to mention is about the marginalized voices, so-called so -called no worries, uh, how they're being called. Uh, the people who oppose the war, they belong to uh, different political, different uh, political ideologies, but uh, nevertheless, they were called no worries and uh, in the behalf of uh, Facebook profile pictures uh, frame. And uh, it's important that, of course, they received widespread, widespread hatred on social media from the from the um, 
from Facebook users or just let's say from masses. But uh, it's it's important to mention here that despite the uh, Azerbaijan is known for uh, persecutions, authoritarian uh, management, but these people are uh, didn't um, receive any state persecution. Uh, neither during the war nor after the war, and it can be explained uh, by the fact that Azerbaijan already had a negative representation in Western media, and this is the unwillingness of uh, the government to receive any further negative uh, comments, negative uh, analysis, and so on. This is first first uh, point, and second point, why these people haven't received any uh let's say didn't face this uh, repressive measures because they are marginalized they don't have any capacity to mobilize the people or to organize something like let's say broader anti-war movement and uh in other words they were harmless just uh, uh without any capacity to uh, mobilize the people and this is the important for the authoritarian regime which is which has uh, which targets only those who uh can uh, somehow uh question the legitimacy of the regime so uh next next slide is about the mainstream opposition versus russia uh this is an important discursive shift because as uh, you know uh after the war we have in nagorno karabakh a russian peacekeeping mission and uh, uh in armenian inhabited areas and it is still unclear what is the mandate of this mission what is the uh how it will look like after five years but uh, it's already estimated that the russian peacekeeping mission will stay there at least for 10 years or even or maybe even more and uh, every five years it will be extended for more more five years and uh, yeah it's it's still unclear is the mandate and uh, there are still many questions and by the mainstream opposition here i mean the popular front party and musabat party which are two biggest oppositional parties in azerbaijan um uh despite they are marginalized despite they don't participate in uh public debates they don't have any access to let's say tv channels which are governmental con government controlled of course and here three points uh three uh, that that they usually make their that they usually art articulate in their uh, discourses first uh the russian presence threatens our sovereignty it is sovereignty of azerbaijan and let's imagine that uh they say that for example if in azerbaijan where opposition will have a chance for mass protests for uh, change and uh, this means that russia can anytime to threaten our sovereignty to enter to easily enter to other areas of azerbaijan or nagorno karabakh or other uh, areas which are uh, uh, which are now under Azerbaijan control. And second is, uh, of course, it's very populist nationalistic argument. It's uh, the fact that there is Russia. It means that our victory is incomplete, and this means that uh, this may mean that Ilham Aliyev is uh, actually is not so good. Actually, it means that his uh, victory he, he actually works for uh, Putin in some extreme cases or. Anyway, there can be different and further argumentations, but the main point is that uh, the fact that there is Russia, it, it means that our uh, victory is incomplete. It means that, uh, yes, it is a victory, but not complete victory. And they, uh, it, uh, through this argument, they try to devalue the victory narratives that are dominant now. And the third argument is that uh, Russian presence eliminates the impact of Turkey. For example, uh, because Turkey is assumed as brother nation, and and uh, this and uh, uh, the fact that Russia is here, it means that Turkey is somehow uh, can't present here in a in a more it can't be engaged uh, and engaged in a more active way. And uh, this uh, was also articulated by the Popular Front Party, for example, recently. And uh, it, of course, here all these activities are uh, in a virtual space. In, on YouTube channels, on Facebook, but uh, only to, can I can only uh, say about uh, mention like one two exceptions when uh, Musabat Party organized a small, a very small rallies in front of the Russian embassy with a demand uh, to not to be <laughs> to be so active in Nagorno Karabakh. For example, they organized such a small rally in front of the the embassy when uh, Russian peacekeeping mission uh, hold a. Uh, victory uh, day um, uh, march on uh, in uh, Stepanakert and Hankendi and 
It was criticized by the opposition. And uh, another point here to mention is about the rise of the right wing populism after the war. And uh, this is somehow not uh, well known uh, for uh, foreign analytics, I, I guess. First, it's about white parties' rise, uh, which are white party in Azerbaijan, AK party. It parrots the name of uh, the Turkish uh, ruling party, uh, Erdogan's party, AK party, uh, and their strategy is social populism, and uh, they're uh, always uh, articulate is, as a people, uh, the underdog, those who belong to Chaykhanas, like the ordinary guys who are um, against the corrupted officials within the government and who, uh, for example, they always articulate the right, the right, social rights of veterans, of uh, uh, just for the ordinary people generally, and especially the veterans who are uh, very unpleasant with the uh, social rights they receive after the war. And of course, here uh, important to mention that AK Party, White Party usually, especially uses TikTok, and uh, some of their videos receive like more than 100,000 uh, views, which is uh, unusual for Azerbaijan. And they, the AK Party, they, they challenge the popularity of the mainstream opposition. But nevertheless, they never target President Aliyev. They, their criticism is always about always targets uh, corrupted officials within the government, but no president. And this uh, fact allowed the mainstream opposition to criticize them for being actually agents of the regime and so on. And the third point is here, their uh, opposition to feminism, LGBT rights, also any progressive ideas. So they just not, it's not just about people versus the government, but all, um, people versus the corrupted officials, but also about uh, to, the opposition to feminism and LGBT plus rights and any of uh, this kind of activities. And, and in a very populist manner saying like they are uh, actually, they, they were of Soros, they, uh, they want to uh, spread degenerates, degeneracies in the nation. So through these narratives, they also try to mobilize people. And uh, another important here uh, point to make here is about the dialogue format or dialogue policy, which was already initiated before the war, but especially activated after the war by the government. And it was supported by the Republican Alternative Party. And this, of course, uh, were also criticized by uh, mainstream opposition. But nevertheless, the point is point here is that, uh, for example, Ilgar Mamadov in his interviews uh, or in his uh, Facebook uh, post, he he claims that through this in, through the engagement in dialogue, they of course we don't know what will happen, what will be outcome, but through the dialogue format, we try to push the government for positive change, especially in NGO legislation, especially uh, to make this the NGO field more transparent. And uh, and uh, at the same time, of course, a mainstream opposition rejected the dialogue format because they assume it as actually not dialogue and actually imitation of dialogue. And uh, here it's important also that they uh, um, for uh, it's uh, there, it can be argued that for this rejection they are punished. Uh, there are several uh, popular front members who received uh, many uh, recently received many years in prison. And uh, yes, this is also. Uh, yeah, and last slide about, uh, as I mentioned before, about the marginalized groups um, after the war, feminists and other small movements, they try st st to stay active. And despite the fact that feminists, for example, they are more marginalized because of their um, uh, because of their anti-war policy, despite the fact they are stay, uh, trying to stay active and also young young activists, same. And uh, and lastly, I want to briefly show the recommendations for uh, actors, for uh, the Western actors in Azerbaijan. Um, yes, they should consider the power dynamics about the uh, government-initiated dialogue process, especially it can be a positive outcome for NGOs. However, this process should be critically assessed. And another point about that, it's uh, this support for um, progressive actors are much needed and 
this is very important for them because it's the only alternative to uh, to nationalist discourses in the country, which are dominant. Uh, of course, there's about this, uh, of course, public statements, gestures, social media posts by Western actors in Azerbaijan are very important and have moral uh, strengths. Uh, yeah, and here I would like to finish and I'm looking forward for your questions and remarks. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Mahors. I understand there's a lot to you know, like uh, tell and unfortunately we're really short in time, but when there will be Q&A and your paper also will be at some point available on our website, then there's more we're going to read or discuss and so on. Uh, give a word to uh, Albert Hayrapetian, who is a senior researcher at the Research Center for Armenian State University of Economics. So Albert, the floor is yours. And please uh, do keep in mind that you have about 10, okay, maximum eight, maximum 10 minutes, and then we'll have to give floor to discuss. Well, thank you very much, dear Mr. Kabalat. Uh, do hear my voice, first of all, if I may ask. Well, yes. I'll quickly start sharing my slides. So it, uh, are they visible now? Yes, they are. Okay. Well, hello, and thank you very much for giving me the floor. It's my pleasure to talk about the economic perspectives that uh, were open after the Second Karabakh War and uh, economic opportunities and to have the paper more specific and I decided to talk about uh, opportunities of revamping the Nakhijevan Yerevan Baku railway and its significance, the opportunities and the obstacles. As you know, there were there was a trilateral statement, not an agreement by statement, co-signed by the presidents of Russian Federation, Azerbaijan, and the Prime Minister of Armenia in, uh, on November 9th of 2020. And the last point was about deblocking the major communication routes in the South Caucasus. As you know, uh, my country, Armenia, it is blocked from both left and right by Turkey and Azerbaijan, and we don't have practically railway connections, save for Georgia. So it's the, our only uh, international railway connection, but uh, it's not a window to the outside world since the uh, railway passes through Abkhazia, the Georgian breakaway region, and the, for, for that, uh, and because of that, we are unable to be uh, connect, railway-wise connected with the Russian Federation. But back in Soviet times, when we were part of one state, so when we knew we will, of course, uh, more than 80% of our produce, according to expert estimates, uh, was uh, carried through this Nakhijevan Yerevan Baku railway. And uh, it is envisaged to open that. Uh, and it is explicitly mentioned, as I already mentioned, uh, in the eighth point of the trilateral statement, but it hadn't become uh, a reality yet because of the following reasons, because there are com uh, competing visions about deblocking the tra uh, transport routes of the region. Azerbaijan claims that it should be a corridor. And by saying corridor, they mean a so they mean uh, encroachment upon uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity of the neighbor states. So they want to have control over territory that belongs to the neighbor state. And I'm not talking about Nagorno-Karabakh, I'm talking about internationally recognized borders of the Republic of Armenia, and more precisely, the Sunnic region. And this uh, railroad, if I go forward, so you'll see that it passes through the south, southern side of Armenia. So here, this uh, the white, this white, so, uh, so it goes to so Yerevan, here we go to Nakhijevan and to the southern part of Armenia, we go to Azerbaijan and to uh, Mahachkala. While on the other hand, the, the official position of the Republic of Armenia is that there is no word about corridor in the statement and uh, it's only about deblocking the transport and communication routes in the region. Uh, and of course, another factor that further complicates the issue is uh, the keeping of prisoners of war in Azerbaijan. As you know, it's already more than one year that uh, active military actions 
well, are over, but still there are hundreds of prisoners of war in Azerbaijan. So, uh, but what is transport co corridor and does it imply sovereignty over others' territory or not? So the official definition, uh, as you can see on your slides, is that transport corridor, when defined in the widest sense, refers to a designated network of transport routes uh, comprising road, railway, uh, inland uh, terminals and border posts. So a corridor is usually established for purposes of enhancing trade and transport facilities. So customs and other regulatory agencies can effectively conduct oversight functions among the various stockholders, stakeholders, sorry. As you can see here in the definition, there is no word about transferring the sovereignty or encroaching upon the sovereignty of neighbor or another sovereign state. And here you can see the stages of transport Corridor, so the transport corridor the, of corridors in general. So the transport corridor is the very first stage, the most underdeveloped stage that implies only single tra transboundary infrastructure, and that it can be developed in second, third, and fourth stages up to the economic corridor that is about huge investments and interstate regulations. Also, some uh, economic corridors they have special governing governing bodies international governing bodies uh, in different parts of uh, the world. Uh, and is it significant for Armenia? Even now that we don't have any connection, say for Georgia, well, as you can see, we, the, the freights that were shipped uh, via those uh, railways, they increased from 2000 to 2019. So they more than doubled, so more than doubled. And here you can see that about 25% of our imports uh, are uh, implemented through those railroads. So they, they are still very much important. And I would like to highlight here two important factors. I had interviews with the experts and they all claimed that uh, carriage via railways is far more cheaper than that uh, via planes or uh, the sea route. Yeah, so it's much more cheaper. And secondly, as we know from economics, so that's a basic tenet, that's a basic maxim that the free trade contributes to better allocation of resources on global scale. And it also contributes to the state, uh, it, it also contributes so that the states are more focused on their comparative advantages. Or in other words, it makes the uh, theory of uh, uh, com compar competitive, uh, compar comparative advantages, practical, uh, practical. And here, uh, as I already showed, that's the root of the uh, of the railway, of the railway that might contribute to removing the obstacles on the way of free trade and effective implementation of the theory of comparative advantages and decreasing the so-called dead weight loss that is caused by um, impeding the international trade. The, but on, on the other hand, it should be acknowledged that uh, free trade is not something prophetic or divine, and it has also its limitations, uh, especially uh, it might be at the expense of green policies or uh, it might also increase the so-called global exploitation and the gap between global north and south and the inequality and so on. So that's, that's a side note, side note that should be acknowledged. So what's the possible solution? And I'm approaching to the end of my presentation. So we need to acquiesce and to accept uh, the wording so offered by Azerbaijan. So if they want it to be called corridor, so no problem, as long uh, uh, as it is within the accepted definition, internationally accepted definition of the word cor corridor, well, that doesn't imply any transfer of sovereignty. Okay, and uh, on a condition that uh, no encroachment upon the national of the, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of not only Armenia, but also all the other parties involved. 
Uh, so uh, that, that should be clear. It, it's really necessary for having peace in the region and for, for refraining of the other military escalations in our fragile region. We need to make this concession to placate uh, the Azerbaijani and also Turkish public and especially their leadership. And uh, I haven't talked about that in my paper, but always when we talk about the Madrid principles, uh, that we are meant to solve the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. One of those principles was about the donors conference. So the donors are the foreign investors who would have uh, invested money for the development and uh, reinstation of the infrastructure in the region had the conflict been solved. And we it's expected that if we uh, managed to have uh, all the transport and communication routes opened as a result of trilateral meetings of the wise prime ministers of Russia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, uh, foreign donations uh, would be attracted to reinstate the already um, devastated infrastructure. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward for your questions. Uh, so I hope I didn't go beyond the time limits. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Actually, and Matloba. Yeah, oh. Matloba. Thank you very much. Perfect timing, Albert. I really appreciate that. Uh, and now I give forward to Dr. Eka Kopia, who is a Dean of the Cox School of Governance at the Cox University. And I'm really looking forward to her take on your papers. Uh, for uh, thank you very much, uh, Shota, for a kind introduction. Uh, thanks to GIP. I, th I think. Uh, if you could also select English language in your interpretation sure. button, that would make it easier. Otherwise, I cannot hear Can you. Can you hear me now? Yes, no, it's good. Thank okay, you. greetings to everyone. Thank you, Shota, for a kind introduction. And thanks for to GIP for involving me, uh, involving me in this project. I had a pleasure of meeting participants in the first round and reading their um, uh, papers, uh, but it was uh, very inter interesting to hear the current papers. Um, I applaud to all three presenters with their wonderful delivery and uh, insightful presentations in the second round uh, and uh, allow me to just uh, review and provide my uh, feedback on um, each of them in certain aspects that might be helpful for uh, these young researchers to advance their uh, specific uh, research areas on the topic or uh, in the vicinity of the topic. So first of all, uh, Mariam's paper on the uh, Russian and Chinese, um, uh, so to say, uh, vaccine diplomacy uh, is a very relevant topic, uh, interesting and both uh, uh, something that requires attention of policymakers as well as um, academicians. Uh, uh, it was very interesting to uh, see how Mariam incorporated the newest concept in terms of uh, types of power, the sharp power, and applied it to the chosen uh, case. Uh, so uh, this was very innovative. Uh, and uh, it was important uh, that she paid attention to the tendency which is really prevalent in our region in the, the specifically how uh, Russia and China uh, have been delivering the vaccines uh, in competition with the Western uh, produced ones and um, uh, what they have uh, tried to achieve as a result uh, of this uh, process in terms of diplomatic support. And uh, to research this topic further, I believe it will be very interesting to look at actual numbers. Uh, maybe numbers are in Mariam's paper, but um, I haven't seen the full version. Uh, and from the presentation, I didn't get the full uh, view and maybe Mariam can comment on it later. Specifically, uh, certain numbers would be interesting. For example, uh, it is a known fact that Russia has used less amount of uh, its own produced vaccines at home than it has sent abroad. Uh, it's also a known fact that uh, uh, even though China was the quickest uh, provider of vaccines to Georgia, 
population in Georgia mainly supported the use of Western vaccines. Uh, for example, NCDC conducted the poll before any vaccines were introduced in the country, and the population overwhelmingly supported um, other uh, productions than uh, the Chinese one, and the Russian one wasn't even put up uh, as an option in the poll because of our red lines with uh, Russia. So um, not to be uh, that upbeat about their uh, external efforts, uh, it would also be fair and helpful to introduce the limitations of their um, influence uh, on uh, countries uh, in the South Caucasus. It will also be interesting to uh, take a note of the fact that China uh, and Russia, they operate uh, similarly, but they operate differently in all three South Caucasus countries. For example, in Armenia, both Russia and China are uh, closely intertwined with the political opposition uh, and less so with the existing government, whereas in Georgia and uh, Azerbaijan, uh, the pattern is uh, vice versa. So it would be helpful to look at the regime likeness uh, as an intervening variable affecting the possible uh, augmentation of the sharp power in uh, smaller countries like our uh, South Caucasian uh, countries. And uh, with the rising uh, trend in uh, uh, authoritarianism, it will be a very useful angle to see uh, behind the facade of uh, democracy, how hybrid regimes are actually uh, helping each other, uh, uh, whether it's an intended or unintended outcome. Uh, so that would be my comment on uh, Mariam's excellent uh, paper and delivery. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, I got to know Bahus uh, via this project. Uh, I think his voice is very uh, unique and bold. Uh, and uh, very competent uh, given the current uh, circumstances. And it's very refreshing to hear um, how he really uh, overviews not only the official position of Azerbaijan, but what is happening in the society in terms of um, uh, ruling uh, party and the opposition uh, dynamics. And so I think he really amplifies the voice of those political parties the, and the minority who have less opportunity to you know, um, voice their uh, positions. Uh, so I think uh, your work is uh, really important and exemplary and uh, I uh, hope you will be given all the opportunities to continue uh, in this manner. So uh, in your case, uh, it was very interesting to hear um, uh, to hear the constellation of uh, positions uh, after the uh, latest Nagorno-Karabakh uh, war and uh, how uh, how the internal dialogue uh, unfolded in Azerbaijan. Most of these things are new to me, and I agree with GIP that we know far less about each other, these three countries of South Caucasus, uh, than we should. And that is a good indication of the fact that our foreign policy outlooks and the means we employ to achieve uh, those goals are so different and that contributes to a lack of understanding and intransigence in uh, knowing more um, about uh, each other. Uh, so um, uh, in, uh, uh, as for the... Uh, as for understanding uh, or exploring your paper uh, further, I think in your delivery, you focused um, uh, a bit more about internal dynamics and it would be best or uh, good uh, to hear more about external actors' influences, uh, whether external actors are doing something, nothing, or um, at least, uh, you know, uh, some part in uh, uh, amplifying the opposition voice uh, in Azerbaijan, what are the obstacles they are uh, facing in this regard, and whether uh, that has any traction with the 
public opinion um, in Azerbaijan. So basically, uh, who are the partners of internal actors on the international stage? Uh, Albert's uh, paper uh, on uh, the Yerevan Nakhichevan Baku railway is Sorry, something. Dr. Rakobe, that... can I very, just make a very minor comment? Uh, unfortunately, uh, the interpreter has only 10 minutes left and she has sure. to go to another event. Uh, so, we could very briefly. Yes. Uh, right. uh, so, uh, that's a topic that I'm also very much uh, interested in. Uh, it was very interesting to hear the overview. Uh, the um, uh, the issue is uh, geopolitical and contested uh, very much. Some of the uh, complexity related to the issue was fleshed out, but uh, there's uh, so much war for uh, more. So I think it would be helpful if uh, uh, Albert looked uh, a bit more about uh, individual national interests of the uh, major actors, including Georgia, uh, Russia, Iran, Azerbaijan, because none of the in, none of these interests are unidirectional. Even Azerbaijan has conflicting conflicting interests vis-a-vis -vis this project. Uh, same for Armenia and especially same for uh, Georgia. Uh, so it will be good to really flesh out the mosaic of this uh, conflicting interests to see whether there is a possibility for any partner in this situation. So the best uh, agreed um, possible outcome on this uh, future uh, unlocking of uh, existing uh, corridors in the region. So I will conclude here. Thank you very much. It's been truly illuminating uh, for me. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kovi. And the fact that we're 25 minutes late the uh, agenda that also illustrates how interesting these topics are and how there's much actually to talk and discuss. So what I would suggest is we take questions and then Within the Q&A, uh, you know, like session, we also answer the comments which were raised by the discussion that will make it easier and we also save time. And for this, I'll need the help of Salome, who will read out the questions and together then we can also address Dr. Akobia's uh, comments as well. Uh, thank you, Shota. So we received two questions in Q&A. One is addressed to Mikhail Sartreladze. The question is about German governance. Uh, government, like uh, why uh, basically Mikhail is uh, convinced that they will uh, draw their attention toward the South Caucasus region because, like he's mentioning, that uh, during the election campaign, uh, uh, like um, um, there was uh, no uh, discussion uh, regarding uh, in, uh, South Caucasus, so it was kind of absent. So uh, the question is uh, basically towards um, the one panelist. And the second question uh, from Tato, uh, I think that uh, all of you can uh, respond to that. Um, so uh, he is firstly um, uh, sending thanks um, for your good presentations. And uh, he, uh, he is asking whether you can summarize which regional power benefited the most from the uh, above mentioned reshuffling in the South Caucasus region. So this two questions uh, were received in Q&A and uh, uh, once you uh, respond, uh, maybe uh, I could suggest to allow the other attendees to ask questions in the microphone because we don't have much time and then uh, other panelists can respond. Okay, so you mean like now we ask if yeah. there's a question? Okay, so if there's a question from the audience, do let us know by using your raise your hand reaction and then you will be allowed to ask a question directly. Right. There are no reactions so far, at least I don't see any. So if they come up during the discussion, we can try at least one question. But now what I would suggest is we start with the uh, presentation of the second panel. So Mariam, Albert and Bakrus will have an opportunity to respond if they would like to, to Dr. Akopia's uh, comments. And then we also give floor to Dr. Sarge Veladze and probably if Hasmik also would like to say something. All right, then you decide how I must go first. I can start, I will be very quick if you allow me. Uh, Dr. Akobia, can you mm -hmm. hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you very much for your very My, valuable- I cannot hear you for some reason. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, 
you can okay, give no, me now, no, I guess. No opinions. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Dr. Corbe, for your valuable comments. And actually, just a quick comment in response on the numbers. In the final version, I've added a lot of numbers where I compare uh, the vaccines that were imported in all three countries. They compare the numbers of imported vaccines by Russia, China, and Western uh, countries. Uh, but the uh, you know the trend and the idea for the future research, which uh, which is um, concerning the political situation and regime likeness in the sort of the reshuffling and all sorts of the effects uh, of the authoritarian regimes is very much interesting. And definitely this is something that I would love to consider in the future, but with the numbers, they are there in the final version. And I really much uh, want to share it with you uh, later and listen to and hear other comments as well in the future. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Papyrus or Albert, yes. if you would like. Yeah, uh, I can next. Uh, thank you, Dr. Akobia, for your comments and for your. Um, it, it really means a lot. You you mentioned about my role, and uh, <laughs> this is really uh, this is really important for me to hear such comments, and uh, it motivates me to continue my work and uh, my PhD studies. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Yes, and uh, you 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 mentioned about the yeah uh, you mentioned about the uh, that there is a need to analyze the role of the external actors mm -hmm. in the conflict, such as the role of Russia, Turkey, and uh, other external actors. For example, here today we talked a lot about the role of the EU, while uh, uh, for example Turkey's role or uh, or Iran's role, for example, is somehow even in uh, the analysis of. Uh, in the uh, other research uh, centers is somehow not uh, not explored fully, and of course I will continue with this. And uh, in my uh, further research, I will focus on this. And the one approach that I would like to take here is a post-colonial approach, because uh, in my opinion, uh, all the war, all what's happened here, all, and even uh, going deeper, the root of hatred between two nations is based on the it has a colonial roots. And here, of course, two colonial uh, countries in the region, Russia and Turkey, play their uh, destructive role. And this is something for, that I will explore further in my research. Thank you, Barbaros. Well, thank, I really appreciate Dr. Akobia's, Akobia's comments, and I'm very much thankful. So the uh, taking into account the time, not the time limits, but the space limits, it was very challenging to accommodate everything. But I would definitely take in, into account all those comments in case if I decide to, for, to further focus on the issue and write other research and or policy papers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, but I think we should let our interpreter leave because she's on another event. Thank you again. And then we can continue with our interpreter to, you know, like, uh, sum up. I think it shouldn't be a problem. Okay, thank uh, you so much. And I apologize. I have to attend another interpretation. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Then I think I'll give floor to now Mikhail for his uh, response to the question, uh, and then also Kasmik would like to add something. Yes, please. Um, thank you, Shota. Also, thank you for the question. Um, uh, yeah, predictions are ungrateful, but I think that um, uh, we have Green Party in foreign ministry in Germany, so uh, Green Party was only one party um, which mentioned um, Eastern Partnership in its election program, um, and, but also aspiration uh, regarding European perspective of associated countries. And uh, Georgia, uh, Georgia is one of, of the three countries. Um, uh, and another reason was uh, the uh, foreign policy concept of Green Party. Um, we, we can say that uh, the foreign policy concept of the new government has to be formed. Um, but uh, we already saw that Annalena Baerbock's uh, upcoming foreign minister of Germany um, had very, very consistent uh, position towards Russia. Uh, and the same is uh, also for uh, Nord Stream 2. Um, and I think that um, uh, that the new government government uh, will will be coherent uh, regarding uh, Russia, um, and uh, from this process, South Caucasian countries 
could benefit. Um, uh, Green Party is also more, more critical regarding human rights um, than other parties. This is my impression. Um, and uh, human rights are a big issue in South Caucasian countries. Um, and the same is also the same can we can say also about the reforms. Um, and um, we saw that uh, in coalition agreement, uh, uh, all three parties, uh, uh, all three parties, uh, um, you know, fixed a position that uh, that the new German government has to establish uh, a common and coherent EU policy towards Russia. Um, and um, um, I, I think the stationing of Russian troops uh, on the on the, not not far from the Ukrainian borders uh, um, uh, will be will first a big challenge for uh, Gem, for for the new German government. Uh, um, so I think th these are some topics like human rights conflicts, uh, but also reforms, um, uh, which uh, which will take a lot of place, uh, which will take place um, in the foreign policy concept of, of a new government, um, and. Um, uh, my hopes are mostly linked uh, um, to, to the fact that the Green Party leads now um, uh, the German Foreign Ministry. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for your concise and brief answer. I mean, more details will be available in your papers once it's published on our website. So those who are interested can also look into it uh, more. And I don't know, Hasmik, would you like to add something and then we can conclude too. Very briefly, thank you for your question. As it is, uh, to me, uh, the war itself was quite tragic with tragic human consequences. And it depends how do you assess like winners and losers. So uh, it, it really depends like on the parameters that you uh, put at the core. But it is also important to, to bear in mind that this is an ongoing process. Uh, so, so much is happening in terms of, um, let's say, uh, when it comes to the like regional power dynamics in terms of uh, finding some sort of the way out what's going to happen in the South Caucasus in terms of, let's say, relations between um, uh, local and global actors. So I would say it is um, far too soon to draw a uh, final conclusion because there is a ongoing process and it remains what's going to happen in this part of the world. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Asmik, and thanks all the participants and attendees who stayed with us this long. And I don't know, Professor Kakachi, if you'd like to say something as a concluding remark, and then we can end today's uh, conference. Uh, thank you, Shaka. I just don't want to waste much of time, but I just would like to thank again for all the participants for very insightful uh, analysis and presentations. and. I hope that we will keep in touch. That's the kind of main idea of this uh, project. And uh, time to time, you may also um, you know, approach us uh, if you have some idea to develop some policy paper, policy briefs, or anything related to, to the region. So, and I hope to see you also in, the, uh, in our future activities, uh, actively involved. And uh, I hope uh, also that uh, you also manage uh, somehow to um to uh, to cooperate with each other and we will try also this as you know this uh, this is just first year of this project and we will have two more years we also try to uh, maybe set up short um, kind of small uh, network of this uh, young researchers in south focus because it's actually you who needs this kind of cooperation and we will be very much uh, happy to be involved and to facilitate this exchange of ideas and also research and some other activities thank you very much again Thank you, and uh, hopefully see you around online or in person at some point.